This discussion is a continuation of the lecture on Chapter 2, The Fundamental Vision. This is Part 2. This chapter began in Part 1 by considering the fundamental vision of the ecological economist. By doing so, we also distinguished between the neoclassical approach and the ecological approach. In Part 1, we talked about the big ideas of the pre-analytic perspective of the ecological economist. The pre-analytic vision being that there is an optimal scale of an economy because it faces limits to growth. An idea of what those limits might be were discussed by Johan Rockström in Let the Environment Guide Our Development, where he characterized the nine planetary boundaries. In essence, what we discussed in Part 1 was that the economic ecologist sees the economic system as only a part of a much larger limiting whole, the whole being that of the Earth's system, while the neoclassical economist sees the whole as the economy itself. Since the economy is not the whole but only a subsystem, we identified an approach that helped us to define an optimal scale of the economic subsystem, limited by the whole Earth system. This required us to consider the diminishing marginal returns of an economy that is in a continual growth mode and asked at what point does the growth become uneconomic growth by growing past the point where the marginal costs of growth exceed the marginal benefits. We will discuss that again here. We will discuss that again here in part two as well as again later in the course. So now in part two, we will use the model of the circular flow diagram and Say's law to illustrate the necessary paradigm shift required of us. The circular flow diagram will help us to understand how the economic subsystem has fundamental leakages and injections, a linear throughput, and is limited by the laws of thermodynamics. Before we talk about the circular flow diagram, we need to first establish a few assumptions that this standard diagram makes. We will consider a simple circular flow first with these assumptions, but then later we will relax a few of the assumptions and consider a more complex diagram. First, let's assume the economy consists of only two sectors, household and firms. Next, Households spend all of their income on goods and services or consumption. That is, there is no savings. All output produced by firms is purchased by the households through their expenditure. There will be no financial sector, no government sector, and there will be no foreign sector or overseas sector. And finally, we will assume that it is a closed economy, assuming no exports or no imports. But let's also not forget that we will also assume a fixed supply of money. And this is a big assumption, as you know, since a continuously increasing money supply is used to stimulate economic growth. We have provided a diagram here of the circular flow for all money and goods, as well as factors of production in the economy. Factors of production being that which is used to produce goods. Notice that the red lines move concrete material goods, while the blue lines move concrete items like the factors of production, land, labor, and capital. But the green lines only moves money around in the economy. So let's look at this flow diagram and note that we have money flowing first as wages from the factor market at the top for labor. Income also comes in the form of interest payments for capital as well as rent for land. Households privately own these factors of production, land, labor, and capital in a capitalistic economy. They sell these privately owned factors to businesses and earn an income by doing so. The factor market consists of all the factors that businesses need to produce goods and services, and when businesses purchase these factors, such as land, labor, and capital, for use in production, this results in some form of income that flows to the household sector that then moves and acts as consumption for goods and services from the product market, at the bottom of the diagram. Notice that the green line represents the incomes that move from households to the product market. 
This green line that represents income from households is used for purchasing goods and services, again from the product market at the bottom. Notice that factor of prices for labor, called a wage, is a cost to firms who use labor as inputs to produce goods. And this is also true of land and capital, which are also factors and is a cost to businesses. Cost is the green line moving from businesses to the factor market where the necessary factors are purchased by businesses for production. Again, this results in income in the economy. Now, businesses sell goods and services, the red line from businesses to the product market, and earn revenue, the green line from the product market to businesses that is used to purchase more factors from the factor market, the blue line from the factor market to businesses. So all factor prices become income, and if it is multiplied by the number in all the working households, this then becomes the total household income for the nation. That is, if we sum up all household incomes, we get the national income. In addition, when you sum up the value of all goods and services, we get the national product. Since all of this national income is used to purchase the national product, or all goods and services which make up the national product, it must be true that all national income must equal all the national product. Notice the nature of the closed loop of this system. National income that comes from production creates the demand for the national product that is produced by businesses. Some economists like to say that supply creates its own demand. You can see that by the nature of where the demand for products come from, that is, the income that results when businesses buy factors of production in order to produce goods that consumers demand, that aggregate demand for products must just equal the aggregate supply of products. We call this Say's Law, and all of this provides us with an axiomatic accounting convention. The national product must just equal the national income. This is the view of the neoclassical model, a simple view without leakages or injections. But now let's relax some of the assumptions and we will find that we will still have the same result. For example, let's suppose we relax the assumptions of no financial sector, no government sector, and no overseas or foreign sector, which means that we're going to have it be an open economy that trades internationally. We have provided a diagram here of the more complicated circular flow. This is a bit more complicated than the circular flow just described and from that which you studied in your principles courses. Because here we have added in both the government and the financial market. This more complete model is still a much simplified version because we are still assuming here that the financial market acts as an intermediary for savings from other actors in the economy and guide savings into investments that act as demand for goods and services that allow for increasing the producing capacity in the economy and increase output and jobs and thus provides more economic growth. Let me just say here that what this model is still missing are the banks and those in the financial industries who engage in creating more money through credit creation, additional forms of money through other means. In other words, the money supply here is assumed to be fixed. For now, let's assume that banks and the financial industry only engage in intermediation by moving savings from households and businesses to investors in the economy. So let's look at this flow diagram and notice first that households and businesses, or let's call them corporations, have switched sides. Once again, we have a factor market Let's focus only on labor as the only factor in the production of goods this time, just to keep it simple. And note that again, we have money flowing as wage from the market for labor, the workforce market, and households then use the wage as income for consumption in the goods and services market that we are now calling the commodity market. Again, as before, the factor prices for labor, called a wage, is a cost of firms who demand labor as inputs in order to produce goods and services. 
Costs, then, is the line moving from the workforce factor market to corporations, where the necessary factors are purchased and used by businesses for production. Looking at the household box, we see again that wage is used as income and purchases the goods and services in the commodity market. Notice also that we have a few leakages and injections into this income that leaves the households. This model considers leakages and injections. Leakages are part of income that is not made available to the economy as consumption expenditures and results in an imbalance in the flow diagram. Injections act as a way to counter income leakages as they add to income and compensate for the leakages. Leakages that occur on income that is subtracted from it and not made available for consumption are savings, taxes, and expenditures on imports. Injections counterbalance leakages and insert this income back into the economy as consumption expenditures. For example, a savings leakage becomes an investment injection when intermediated by the financial sector who make it available to investors who then act as consumers and purchase commodities in the commodity market with it. While taxes act as a leakage, then become government spending for roads and military and such. See G moving from government to the commodity market? Government also transfers income back to households and corporations through transfer payments, either back to households or to businesses as income subsidies or income injections, if you will. Imports are income leakages that send income to foreign nations as we purchase their products. But exports add income back as an income injection to counter the leakage of imports. Let's take the factor wage given to labor as income and multiply this number by the number in all working households. This then would represent the total household income for the nation. Now let's add to that income government expenditures as income and investment as additional income and imports as well. So consumption plus government spending plus investment plus the difference between exports and imports should account for all the income that has been made in the economy, according to this model. That is, if we sum consumption plus investment plus government spending, plus the difference between exports and imports, we should get the national income. Now, when you sum up the value of all goods and services in the commodity market, we should get the national product. So, the national product is actually equal to the GDP, the gross domestic product, or in other words, aggregate supply. But this must mean that the national income must equal the national product. That is, when we sum up all income plus government spending plus investment plus the consumption from the difference between exports minus imports, we get national income which is equal to aggregate demand. And this means that aggregate demand must just equal aggregate supply. Our outcome is exactly the same as in the simplified version discussed earlier, axiomatic by accounting convention. So, in equilibrium, we expect that all income should equal all output or GDP. And since all income makes up consumption or GDP, this is the aggregate demand. But GDP is the commodity market and thus also equal to the aggregate supply. Once again, we find that this circular flow diagram is a closed or an isolated system in which we see the flow of exchange between households, corporations, government, and foreign households. All income becomes consumption, which just equals the value of goods and services in the commodity market. And note that all leakages equal injections, even if the government must step in to make sure it equates. Once again, we see the nature of this closed or isolated system, and this is the perspective of neoclassical economics. But it does not take into account it is actually really not an isolated system. 
the environment also plays a very important key role in the economy. And this model ignores fundamental injections and leakages in the larger system. That from and to the environment. Say's law states that aggregate demand must equal aggregate supply. But let's be clear about what we mean by Say's law. It's really a simple, trivial truth. National income must equal the national product. It's really an accounting equation, or that the aggregate supply is really equal to the aggregate demand. Production creates the income for the consumption of the goods that are produced with the factors who receive the income. Supply creates its own demand. For a long time, economists believed that due to Say's law, the possibility of long-term and substantial unemployment could be corrected naturally if the natural mechanisms that triggered rebalancing were left intact. But let's be clear that they were painfully aware of the financial crisis that occurred often in the 1800s, and they attributed these crises to problems in the banking and financial sectors that destroyed the natural mechanisms that could correct the imbalances. Many economists at the time were aware of the problems with the banking sector as well as with the financial sector that destroyed these natural mechanisms. If money is kept out of the equation, or if the money supply is held constant, Say's law is trivially true. What isn't true is that the economic system is itself self-correcting due to Say's law. The Great Depression put a damper on the belief that natural mechanisms could correct the imbalances and that aggregate supply may not always equal aggregate demand. The Depression convinced many economists that the economic system was not really a natural self-regulating system but needed help from the government. The explanation that was given at the time of the Great Depression by John Maynard Keynes is that it was due to leakages and injections and that an imbalance in leakages and injections could cause a system to equilibrate at a very low level of unemployment in the short run. And injections of demand were needed to address the shortcomings of leakages of demand. And again, this is the perspective of the neoclassical economist. But it does not take into account it is actually not an isolated system by itself. The environment also plays an important key role in the economy, and this model again ignores fundamental injections and leakages in this system. Now, this is not to suggest that the leakages and injections that we will shortly discuss are the cause of the Great Depression or of our current financial crisis. We are only trying to point out the pre-analytic perspective of the neoclassical economist, as opposed to the ecological economist. And our point is that the neoclassicalists see only an isolated, closed system, while the ecological economist sees a much larger system for which the circular flow is only a part of. Leakages and injections that macroeconomics focus on come in the form of savings and investment, taxes and government spending, imports and exports, and an ever-increasing or expanding money supply. These leakages and injections force the wrong focus on the system. Notice that this is not the pre-analytic vision of the ecological economist, but the leakages and injections of the neoclassical economist and assumes their pre-analytic vision. In assuming that the economic system itself is the whole, they have ignored the fundamental throughput of matter and energy from the environment from which the economy obtains its sustenance. In all fairness to the neoclassical economist, economic thought began when it was easy to assume that the biophysical world was so large relative to its economic subsystem that the physical constraints imposed by the laws of thermodynamics and ecological interdependence were not binding. In fact, they probably were binding when economic thought began, just not enough to make the costs significant enough to include them in the model. The abstraction at the time was a realistic assumption. It certainly made modeling of the economy much simpler, but to some degree they are always binding, 
It's just that today they have become increasingly binding and in fact may have become very limiting as the scale of the economy grows large relative to the containing biophysical system and much more costly to ignore. We must pay more attention to the thermodynamic constraints on the economy, indeed to the entropic nature of the economic process. Unfortunately, our economic theory that has been developed currently has no way to account for this newly imposing constraint within macroeconomic models. To be sure, we have many microeconomic models that can account for scarcity of resources and pricing problems with non-marketable goods, and we will discuss this in later chapters. But we do not have any macroeconomic models that take into account the laws of thermodynamics. Economists did not consider the analysis of the biosphere as even part of what economic theory really was all about. What this circular flow diagram has left out is the linear throughput of matter and energy that the economic system relies on for sustenance and the sinks that it relies on for storage for its wastes. The economic system relies on, as sustenance, low entropy resources, mines, trees, wells, cropland, which it turns into high entropy resources after producing GDP output that the economy returns to the ecosystem for either recycling or as wastes. Its sources are low entropy and its sinks are necessarily high entropy sinks. So what is at issue here fundamentally? Well, it centers around what is really flowing in the circular flow diagram and what it ignores. Actually, because the pre-analytic vision of traditional economics is such that the economy is modeled as an isolated system, the flow really must be called abstract exchange value. When goods arrive to the households, the soul of the exchange value jumps out of its embodiment in goods and takes on the body of factors for its return trip to the firms, whereupon it jumps out of its body of factors and becomes goods again. The entire focus is on exchange value, as one would expect with economic analysis. The entire system does not address at the macro level the wastes or leakages that accumulate as the goods and services are consumed and as we make the rounds in this ad infinitum circle. Nor does it address at the macro level the natural capital, the stock of natural resources, air, water, geology, mines, land, all of which are subject to the laws of thermodynamics. Some natural capital provide businesses with free services. For example, the ecosystem services like clean water, fertile soil, pollination that help underpin the economy and helps to sustain it. If natural capital is overextended or consumed indefinitely, this impacts the flow of real injections into the economy. Injections like a sustainable flow of trees for lumber, a sustainable flow of fish for food, or well-maintained ecosystems that ensures a continued injection of natural capital and resources. Well-maintained forests or rivers may provide an indefinitely sustainable flow of new trees or fish, whereas Overuse of those resources may lead to a permanent decline in timber availability or fish stocks. It is an extension of the economic capital defined as resources used in the production of more resources and goods and services. Ignoring natural capital as a fundamental injection that must be protected provides the economy with essential services. It is an extension of the economic capital defined as resources used in the production of more resources and goods and services. Natural capital is a fundamental injection that provides the economy with essential services, like erosion control and crop pollination by insects, which in turn ensure the long-term viability of other natural resources. Ignoring the continuous supply of these services from the available natural capital assets could impact not just the well-being of future generations, but the viability of the economy itself. The economy is fundamentally dependent upon a healthy, functioning ecosystem and diversity of habitats, and ecosystems' health and viability are important components of the sustainability of natural capital. 
The scarcity of natural resources and the environment is pulled into the system and dealt with at the microeconomics level. That is the neoclassical approach. We will discuss the problems with this perspective later in the course. But suffice it to say here that there are problems with the microeconomic approach with putting a price on such goods. And without accurate prices, scarcity is not easily determined, nor are the social costs and benefits well evaluated on the market with these microeconomic techniques. The microeconomics approach also struggles to account for the binding laws of thermodynamics. So let's pause for just a moment and review the first two laws of thermodynamics. Several videos have been posted to the Blackboard course website that explains these first two laws. You may wish to pause this lecture and review them. The laws of thermodynamics describe how temperature, energy, and entropy of thermodynamic systems at thermal equilibrium behave under various kinds of circumstances. The first law is about conservation of energy. And the first law guarantees that the conservation of energy, or that the total energy of a system, remains constant and that energy is always conserved, which means that it can neither be created nor destroyed. It only transforms from one form of energy to another. Now, entropy is a thermodynamic quantity representing the unavailability of a system's thermal energy for conversion into mechanical work but often it's interpreted as the degree of disorder or randomness within a system. And the second law highly relies on the law of entropy. The second law states that the total entropy can only increase over time for isolated systems. Neither energy nor manner can enter or leave an isolated system. The total entropy remains constant in ideal cases where the system is in a steady state equilibrium. Let's discuss the laws of thermodynamics as it relates to economic models. The first law states that energy cannot be created or destroyed but only transformed from one form of energy to another. The second law is a bit more of a constraint. It states that entropy of an isolated natural system will always tend to stay the same or increase. In other words, the energy in the universe is gradually moving towards disorder. And this suggests the second law is more about inefficiency and informs us that the universe is moving towards degeneration and decay and that the universe is engaged in this irreversible process. The ecosystem will always tend to stay the same or increase in entropy. In other words, the energy in the universe is gradually moving towards disorder. The first and second laws of thermodynamics could be called, according to Herman Daly in Thermodynamic Roots of Economics, the first and second laws of economics, because without resource depletion and no pollution, and with infinite resources available for use, we could satisfy all our needs and scarce resources would not be an issue. There would be no problems with storage of waste or garbage or abundant resources. Of course, this is impossible because the first law sets the amount of everything as fixed. That is, you can't have more of everything because the universe only has a fixed amount of matter and energy that can be transformed into different matter and energy. Scarcity is with us permanently. As Daly puts it himself, quote, the first and second laws of thermodynamics should also be called the first and second laws of economics. Why? Because without them, there would be no scarcity, and without scarcity, no economics. Consider the first law. If we could create useful energy and matter as we needed it, as well as destroy waste matter and energy as it got in our way, we would have superabundant sources and sinks. No depletion, no pollution, more of everything we want without having to find a place for stuff we don't want. The first law rules out this direct abolition of scarcity. But consider the second law. Even without creation and destruction of matter energy, we might indirectly abolish scarcity if only we could use the same matter energy over and over again for the same purposes. You know, perfect recycling. But the second law rules that out. 
And if one thinks that time is the ultimate scarce resource, well, the entropy law is time's irreversible arrow in the physical world. So it is that scarcity and economics have deep roots in the physical world as well as deep psychic roots in our wants and desires. An end quote. Yet the macroeconomic models relies on low entropy input from sun, for example, to make all human economies even possible. When we burn reserves of oil and coal in the geological blink of an eye that took a millennia to create, we are in essence transforming the low entropy energy captured from ancient sunlight and buried deep underground, and then releasing it into the economy as high entropy wastes. The vital source of low entropy input should be considered a treasure and used as efficiently as possible, and our model should account for the use of this vital throughput as a limiting factor in the macroeconomic growth models rather than relying on microeconomic analysis that requires privatization of nature's resources for efficient allocation. The macroeconomic system fundamentally relies on the second law of thermodynamics as throughput. There is a constant stream of low entropy energy from the sun that maintain life as we know it. Without this entropy gradient, life can't exist. Unfortunately, most mainstream economists do not discuss the second law of thermodynamics in spite of the fact that it governs our ecosystem and life on Earth, which involves the macroeconomic system. The circular flow diagram relies, however, on abstract exchange value without any reference to the throughput and thus the laws of thermodynamics. The circular flow assumes that these laws are somehow just not binding. According to the first law of ther According to the first law of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy, this means that the throughput of a system must balance. The input must equal the output with the accumulation. Economic growth assumes accumulation is occurring. In a steady state growth, inputs would equal output and growth or accumulation would be zero. If input flow is equal to output flow, this means that all natural resources would equal all waste outputs. Throughput implies two sinks, one for resource depletion and two for pollution or wastes. Throughput is not a circular flow idea, like the exchange values in the circular flow diagram. It, importantly, is a one-way flow from low entropy source to a high entropy sink. And this is due to the second law of thermodynamics. We will never be able to recycle 100%. A good way to view recycling are eddies in a one-way river. And remember that energy, according to the law of entropy, is not recyclable at all. It takes more energy to recycle than the amount preserved from recycling. It is not realistic to believe that the economy can recycle all its waste products and use them again as inputs. The circular flow diagram implies that the economy is a never-ending circular flow that reproduces itself. But the key to understanding the problem with the circular flow diagram is that the source for replenishment comes from outside the circular flow diagram. And this is where economists mistake the part for the whole. The whole must consider the sources for replenishment and the sinks for wastes. Otherwise, it is an isolated system that is really not circular at all because it does not consider its source of replenishment for the next time it completes the circle. Nor does it consider the sinks of wastes that begin to interfere with the life processes impeding and harming the sources for which the circular flow diagram relies on for energy and matter. Well, that's it for now, but I recommend for a better understanding that you... Well, that's it for now. I do recommend that you read Box 2-2 on page 30 and 31. The textbook provides a good analogy of linking the laws of thermodynamics to both renewable and non-renewable energy sources. 
And while you're reading Box 2-2, keep in mind that sunlight is a renewable energy with infinite quantity and a fixed flow, while fossil fuels are a non-renewable energy with a finite quantity variable flow. And today, humanity burns around 400 years of ancient sunlight in the form of fossil fuels every year. Well, that's it for now, but before we quit, here is a concepts inventory for you to take. Check your understanding of thermodynamics by taking this short quiz. I suggest you pause the video after I read this question and try to answer the question. The question will be provided shortly on the next diagram. Consider the following idea. A ship heats its boilers and propels itself without the use of coal or oil in the following way. It pumps in warm seawater, extracts heat from that seawater, concentrates the extracted heat in its boilers, and discharges the cooled seawater back into the ocean. The discharged water may be ice if enough heat has been taken from it. Now ask yourself two questions. First question, does this idea violate conservation of energy? Yes or no? Second question, could this idea be made to work? Well, the answer to the first question is B. It does not violate conservation of energy because the heat in the boiler is that which is supposed to have come from the warm seawater. No energy is created. It is simply transferred from one place, the water, to another, the boiler. The answer to the first question is B. It does not violate conservation of energy because the heat in the boiler is that which is supposed to have come from the warm seawater. No energy is created. It is simply transferred from one place, the water, to another, the boiler. And the answer to the second question is also B. If it could be done, it would be done. We simply find that this sort of thing can occur in our world. Our collective life experience, after all, is our guide to the laws of physics. We call the non-occurrence of this process the second law of thermodynamics. Heat tends always to flow from a hot place to a cooler place. Heat by itself will not flow from the warm seawater into a much hotter boiler. It would be like a ball freely flowing uphill. Heat could be forced to go from the cooler place to the hotter place. That's what happens in a refrigerator. But it takes energy to force it from the cool to the hot place, and the energy required to force it would more than equal the energy which could be obtained from the boiler. The ship's world is the surface of the sea. If all the world is at one temperature, no matter how high, none of the heat in the world, no matter how much there is, could be converted to work. Well, that's it. Here are the big ideas for you to ponder. Until the next lecture, talk to you then, Professor Spihar.